We begin with the audit New Zealand review of spending by Dr Nigel Murray while he was CEO of the Waikato DHB. It's not yet been officially released, but Checkpoint obtained a copy this afternoon. In short, it's the official confirmation of what we've been detailing on the programme. Dr Murray lived the high life, really. Sometimes without approval, sometimes with retrospective approval, sometimes with so little paperwork, it's difficult to know whether he had approval or not. He travelled internationally while he was also on sick leave. He went to Australia twice in the same week. He extended international trips with stated business purposes. Audit NZ could find no evidence of, and he spent and spent and spent. We wanted to talk to Nigel Murray. He's not returning calls. We wanted to talk to DHB Chair Bob Simcock. He's not returning calls. But Dave McPherson is an elected member of the DHB board who received the report on Wednesday. Look, it uh, backs up everything that we thought, and with spades on, it's, uh, it shows that there, we had a, a man in that position that didn't care less about the fact that he was spending public money, clearly had a sense of entitlement, and uh, was absolutely cavalier in the way he did everything, um, which meant there was a mess left behind him that um, poor old DHB workers have been having to try and clean up for some time, loyally trying to back him up to start with and after some time reporting it to the board and we've taken it over, got this order to opinion um, and got and done the other investigations, um, getting hammered in the public, all because this guy thought he was entitled to do whatever he felt like. That doesn't appear on the face of it to be an exaggeration. Let's look at the report and quote from it verbatim. A number of instances of travel were not approved. One instance of travel which was approved by the Chief Financial Officer who does not have delegated authority to approve the Chief Executive's travel requests. A number of instances of travel each year were retrospectively approved. A number of instances of travel where amendments to the travel arrangements resulted in a different cost of travel, almost always more. A number of the travel request forms in 2016-17 did not include the stated reason for travel. A a number of travel bookings had a stated purpose but did not explain why each element of the travel was required. I could go on for the rest of the program. What on earth was going on here and where was the supervision? Yeah, well, I think that's the big problem. You know, I guess in any organisation you have people that become problems. We had the top person becoming a very big problem here and there was no oversight happening. Uh, under the rules that we operate under, the, the chair of the DHB board is supposed to be the only person authorised to sign off uh, these expenses. We um, were aware from a, more than a year ago that he hadn't filed his annual returns, that's the chief executive, hadn't filed his annual returns to the State Services Commission showing, showing his expenses for the year. Nothing was done about that. Um, the chief executive, sorry, the, the chair of the board has been aware since February this, this year uh, of the severe problems, the fact the returns weren't filed, the fact that unauthorised expenses had happened. He didn't even tell the board for almost six months. So, Hold on, sorry, can I come in there? Yep. So the, the chair of the board, Bob Simcock, yep. knew that this situation was unfolding, more or less as described in this review, and didn't tell the board for how long? Uh, almost six months. He knew in the first week of February, we heard, I believe, about the uh, middle of, um, of July. So that was the case. He didn't, Bob, uh, I'm not, I don't think knew, or certainly didn't know all the specific details. But he Absolutely. Knew well, the review doesn't know the specific details. Yep. I mean, the, the review right. says because the chief executive himself, Nigel Murray, who has disappeared without trace, is the only fellow really who knows the details of many of, the, many of these trips. He's, the review says we have not received all the information requested. So clearly the chairman of the board didn't know what was going on either. But... Yep. If we go back to 2014 and the concerns raised by Sue Maroney, the concerns raised by Annette King, the concerns raised by the Association of Salaried Medical Specialists about hiring Nigel Murray, and they were raised directly in some cases with the chairman of the board, and he gave assurances that he would keep a close eye on Nigel Murray. Was the eye he was keeping close enough? Definitely not. In fact, I don't think it was happening at all. There was some really basic stuff 
it didn't happen, like that annual return from 2015, 2016, 2017. Three years in a row. The first year should have been a red flag, but it just was I mean, Bob Simcock didn't deliberately do this. He just wasn't, he'd just taken his eye off the ball, I guess, and uh, didn't take his, his job seriously either in that respect. Should Bob Simcock remain chairman of the Waikato DHB? I've said for some time because of the situation that he shouldn't. I don't think the public has any confidence in the DHB and the DHB leadership. Uh, I don't think many of the staff do. They want to get on with their jobs, but they think there's a bunch of clowns leading, leading them at the moment, not to put too fine a point on it. Would we know about this yet, or to the extent we know about it, if people within the organisation, including, we understand, secretarial staff, hadn't blown the whistle on Nigel Murray so great with their concerns about what was going on? I think it eventually would have come out, but definitely not as soon as it has. And, and by in saying that, it's obviously not nowhere near soon enough. Uh, I mean, they, those staff did know about some of this for quite a while. We're talking about over a year. But they were trying to sort it out directly with the CEO because they were employed by him. Some of them worked absolutely directly for him. And, uh, you know, they felt some loyalty and they thought, oh, well, he's got a messy situation here. Let's help him clear it up. And he promised to clear it up and did nothing about it. And they end up, ended up being totally compromised, and in some cases resigning their jobs because of that, um, because they felt so compromised. It was totally unfair on them, as well as obviously being unfair on the organisation and, and the taxpayers. Some of this just defies uh, normal comprehension. There does, for example, seem to have been occasions on which Nigel Murray was simultaneously travelling internationally and also on sick leave. Absolutely. I, and I, we hadn't been aware of that until this particular report, audit report came out. That's horrifying, and it says, what sort of systems do you have, DHB, where you can pay for travel at the same time as approving sick leave? Uh, you know, we've, we've got very poor ob oversight systems, obviously. I mean, the fact that the chief executive, uh, as you showed when interviewing Cly uh, Craig Climo last night, was on holiday for more than half of the last financial year on a salary of $560,000 a year. That, that defies description, you know. How come that wasn't um, noticed? Yes, he was travelling for, for, for half the year, right? But he also, and we know this because it was discussed at a Health Select Committee, received a $21,000 payout for untaken annual leave. I mean, the more you look at this, the less it makes sense. He should not have been paid that. Um, and we had, a, in fact, had a dis recent discussion about that at the board. There's some argument going on over that. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's money that he owes back to us now. That's probably going to be argued about for some time to come. What happens now? Well, look, the, the, what should have happened actually on Wednesday when we received this opinion um, was that we should have made a series of decisions about what we were going to do on each of those recommendations, should have released the report, uncut, warts and all, as it was, and said, and this is what we're going to do about it. We have yet to do that exercise. I'm not sure when that's going to be happen, ha happening. I'm going to write to the um, to Bob Simcock, the chair, because he still is the chair, despite my wishes, um, and ask him to convene a discussion about what we're going to do about that. Uh, we've also got the State Services Commission running an investigation about to start, I understand, at the order of the Minister into what's happening. Um, the board at the moment is sitting back like stunned mullets waiting for someone to tell them what to do I feel rather than being proactive here but uh, we're going to be trying to push them to you know, give, give some confidence that we can get on top of this problem. The elected board member Dave McPherson talking to us earlier so what do people say about this? Well not much. The State Services Commissioner declined an interview today. Board Chairman Bob Simcock did not return our calls today. Uh, our reporter Andrew McRae went over to his home 
he wasn't there. Um, Bob Simcott was appointed to the board by the former health minister, Tony Ryle, in 2013, the year before Nigel Murray got the job, of course, with Mr Simcock's oversight. Uh, former minister Tony Ryle refused to discuss the issue with us. Indeed, he hung up when we called. The office of the current health minister, David Clark, has not returned our calls. And we would like to talk to the new minister about this board chairman, Bob Simcock, and his oversight of Nigel Murray. That invitation remains open throughout the duration of the programme, as do all our invitations on this affair, Bob Simcock. We'd love to hear from you, Nigel Murray. We'd love to hear from you, but we won't hold our breath.